Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a blessing to be here. And how many years of memory now come to me. I left the service last night and I was going to my motel and uh, I was with uh, my son and my daughter, uh, both of which went to college here. And uh, Rachel's married to Jerry White, who graduated from here, and they are missionaries in Tanzania, Africa. And Jerry was questioning me as I left here, going back to the motel, and he said, um, he said, Dad, tell me something. You, how many years ago did you come? I said, I think it was 43 years ago, just a couple of years after the first pastor school. And I don't know how many I've been to, just year after year almost, all of these years. And he said, well, tell me about the changes in pastor school. What was it like? He was a young man in his 20s, you know, and I've been coming here for over 40 years. And he said, what was it like? And I began to describe some of the early years of pastor school. And, of course, uh, let him know that most of the changes have been cosmetic. There's a lot of sentimentality to it. As you look back over these 40-some years that I've been coming here to pastor school, I think about the great voices and the great men of God that are now in heaven along with Dr. Howells and many of those that loved him and served with him. And I think about so many, almost every pastor school is just imprinted upon my mind. So many oceans of humorous and interesting things as well as powerful, life-changing services. And uh, how it's changed my life, how it's changed the life of thousands that I have been influenced by and have been able to influence. We organized a church, it would be 38 years ago this September, and uh, organized the Marion Avenue Baptist Church. Those people had never seen a Bible preaching church and uh, didn't know what one was like. And uh, we didn't have but just a couple of men, their wives. And I brought, first thing I did, I'd been to pastor school before I was married, and I brought them to pastor school, a couple of those men whom I wanted to put on as deacons when I organized the church. And uh, they felt like the Queen of Sheba when she saw Solomon's glory when they came here. And uh, they said, Preacher, if they can do it in Hammond, we can do it in the cornfield. Now, they didn't know it had never been done to cornfields before, but I didn't have the heart to tell them, and before I could get word to them, they did it and built a great work there. And, uh, of course, we kept bringing people back each pastor school, and God used that in a great way to found the Marion Avenue Baptist Church and to pro propagate it uh, along the way. Uh, boy, I tell you what, if you'd known the pastor schools I've known, you would, in fact, you would, in fact, be thanking God for pastor school now. Uh, I mean, you just would. And some of you are laughing or older, you know what I mean. I mean, listen, good night, no breaks, no breaks really, all in the auditorium. I mean, that's a little 2,500-seat auditorium. That was before they went the, uh, the whole thing over there. You know, I was in that first one. And I'm telling you, it was all day long. I mean, no breaks. I mean, you couldn't go to the bathroom. People came. People came on Monday night that didn't get to go to the bathroom till Friday. I mean, it was... <laughs> I mean, you, you ought to thank God. I mean, really, Dr. Howells was preaching. I don't know if he was in pastor school or where, but he was preaching. And he, he was irritated. People getting up and going out to the bathroom and getting up and going out. And he was irritated. And, uh, of course, there's a lot of things irritated Dr. Howes. I mean, a lot of things. In those days, they had these squeaky uh, cassette recorders, you know, and they would set them uh, there on the altar, and uh, he hated them because they'd often squeak and make noise. I've seen him, you don't know how many times I've said, Hey, stop it! Kill it! Do anything with it! You know, uh, all those memories come back. But people were going in and out, and he was irritated when he came to the pulpit. I mean, irritated. He said, no, we've had a lot of going in and out. And he said, it's uncalled for. And he said, listen, and he aimed to say, I have not, go, I have not left a church service to go to the bathroom in 67 years. 
But instead, and he said it like that. You know how he said it? But instead, here's what he said. I have not gone to the bathroom in 67 years. And there was two little boys on the front row, and you could hear one of them just as loud say to the other, that's got to be a record! <laughs> Turning your Bibles to the book of Exodus. Exodus. I did a great injustice. I know there's a deadline. What is that according to the schedule you have? When I'm finished. No, that won't work. i got a preacher coming through here in a minute. What? Can you help me? An hour, okay? All right, I'll lay this watch right here, and I'll try to hold to that. Um, all right, Exodus chapter number 14, please. Everybody stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. Exodus chapter 14. I'd like to begin reading. I'd like to, I'd just like to read anywhere. You got a King James Bible, you turn over to Exodus 14, you'll find it starting along in about number 10. If you don't have a King James, you may not find it at all, it may not be there anywhere. But Exodus chapter 14 and verse number 10. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, thou hast taken us away to die in this wilderness. Wherefore hast thou dealt thus w uh, with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in this wilderness. Verse 13, And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show, you, uh, show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today Ye shall see them again no, uh, no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they, and here's the two words, go forward. Go forward. Go forward. Go forward. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we need you now. Lord Jesus, there's hundreds of people in this room that need to hear from heaven. Lord, what marvelous messages we've already heard. Oh, what powerful, powerful, every sermon hitting, I mean hitting by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. But the meeting's not over, Lord. And though none of us men, and especially myself, have felt up to the task humanly, we know who he is. We know that the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the cross is up to the task. I pray, Lord Jesus, you'll bless us now as we preach the message. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, please. Well, I have a good message or two on the cross. At least I did till Monday night. <laughs> that Pope fella didn't, me a, didn't leave me a blooming thing to say, not a thing. Amen. But the Lord brought me to this text, speaking to the children of Israel that they go forward. Churchill, in the greatest speech he ever made, and made it the greatest any statesman ever made, said, never, 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 never turn back. Amen. Arthur Sullivan wrote, onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. Another wrote, 
onward, forward, shout aloud, Hosanna. Christ is captain of the mighty throng. Another wrote, Mine eyes have seen the coming of the glory of the Lord. He hath trampled out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Marching on. Marching on. In John 20, Peter went forward. And at thy word, he said, I let down the net and found great fruit. In 1 Kings 7, uh, verse 8 through 4, the four lepers went forward when saying, Why sit we here till we die? They went forward and they found a day of good tidings and good food and good joy for everybody. In Daniel 6, 22, Daniel went forward into the lion's den to hold the convictions God had given him. And he found great protection as the lion said, Well, shut my mouth if it ain't Daniel. In Joshua chapter 6, the children of Israel marched around the walls till they felt like total idiots. Once a day for six days and on the seventh day, seven times, and the walls came a-tumbling down. They went forward. They went forward. The three Hebrew children uh, went forward and found in the fiery furnace great company as the form of a fourth man walked with them and the smell of smoke did not even pass on them. Dan Whittle wrote, marching on, marching on, for God count everything but laws. Somebody said, if I stumble, uh, pick me up. If I falter, push me on. But if I turn back, shoot me, I got to go forward. I mean, listen, when you go out yonder to a grave and you bury all you ever called sweetheart. I mean, you put all you ever called sweetheart in the ground after pastoring a church like I have for nearly 38 years, and you walk away, the devil will say to you, that's enough. That's enough. You fought a good fight, and you finished your course. That's enough. But I look the devil in the eye, and I say, devil, my life's not over. I got work to do, and by the grace of God, I will go forward. We need to go forward. We are going backwards too fast. We need to go forward. We need to go forward in a lot of ways. Number one, we need to go forward in separation. In separation from the world. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 17. Come ye out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord God, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will be a father unto you. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Brother, we need to go forward and we need to put some feet on our heart determination and our dedication. We need to do more than just come to the altar and say, Lord, I need to get right with God and get out of the world. You need to get up and get out. You need to get up and get out. God ought to change some things about you. He ought to change a lot of things about all of us. We don't live holy like the great men of God in the past lived. That's why we don't have power. Your power will be in direct effect of your holiness. Now, I could preach on a lot of things. I could preach a six-month series. I could preach, and I preach series in my church on holiness and separation and all of that. But I'm here to promise you one thing, friend. There is nothing... Hey, by the way, bring my illustration out, if you would. There is nothing in all of this world... Keep, stay with me, camera. I might get remote here in a minute. There is nothing in all of this world that has done more to damn our holiness and to keep us from being separated from the world like a monster we're going to bring out and show you here on this platform right here. You're about to see the number one thing above all things I could talk about that has destroyed our testimony that has robbed our home. You're looking at it right there. That's it. The television. And the dirty, rotten computer and all the filth that comes on that too. And you know that it is. You're looking at it right there. I mean, you're looking at it. If you want to know what happened to Monopoly, that's it. If you want to know what happened to family time, that's it. If you want to know what happened to husband and wife fellowship, that's it. If you want to know what happened to good readers in your home, you're looking at it right there. If you want to know what happened to picnics and it, what happened to checkers and, and what happened to Scrabble and what happened to these things, you're looking at it right there. That's it right there. Now, wait a minute. If you want to know why we have the blasphemy and the vulgarity and the permissiveness and the materialism and the worldliness and the carnality and all the dirty, rotten things, more than anything in the world, you're looking at it right there. I mean, you're just looking at it. 
And, uh, I, I mean, you just are. And uh, you say, now, uh, Brother Brown, now wait a minute, let me park right here and say something. Let me just park right here. There's a great man of God. He may be in this room now, one of the greatest preachers in America. And I know, I've known him for years. I have been in and out of his home unannounced multiple times for years. And he's always had a television in his home, but I've never seen it on. I would imagine from time to time he turns it on. I imagine from time to time he'll catch the news or the weather or something. But I do know that he couldn't have watched much of anything because he, was, he got up so early, stayed up so late, and was so much on the go, he wouldn't have had time to watch anything on it. Now, out of his church came a Pharisee. And this Pharisee went over and got his little group and was piddling around doing absolutely nothing when this great man of God had built a great church and living a very holy life. And he ran into this man of God one day, and I know, I can call these names, I know who it was. He ran into this man of God and he said to him, i tell you what, and he called his name, i tell you what your problem is. You got that ungodly television in the house. That's your problem. I want to park right here and say this. There is more spirituality in the tip end of that godly pastor's little finger that was in that Pharisee's whole body. Now, you've got to watch the Pharisees. The Pharisees will mess you up. I'm not here to condemn good people for what they don't do wrong. I don't live in your house. I don't know what you do. I don't know what you see. I don't know what you do with the television. I don't know what you do with the Internet. I'm not there. I'm not he here to judge you. There's hope. I've never had a television in my house. We never had a, a computer in our house. Raised seven children uh, who are scattered over the earth, all faithful and independent Baptist churches. One of them sang right there with his wife a while ago, and uh, uh, they got along well. We did all that without the television and the Internet, but that's that's what we chose to do, and I'm not judging you for what you do or what you, you're doing or what you're going to do. But having said that, having said that, preachers, if you had any idea what your people were watching on that stupid thing on Saturday night till 1130, you would not wonder that they sit and look at you like a bullfrog looking at a, in a hailstorm on Sunday morning. I mean, you, you just wouldn't. I, I mean, you just wouldn't. You, you, you'd, wonder, you, you'd want to quit if you knew what your people were watching. And I know what you're saying. Now, Brother Brown, uh, Brother Brown, uh, preach the Bible. Just now, you got off on a tangent now. Preach the Bible. Okay, I'm sorry. I got off on a tangent. I'll preach the Bible. You watch it now while I preach the Bible. 1 Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from all appearance of evil. 1 Thessalonians 4.3, uh, this is the will of God, even your sanctification. 2 Corinthians 6.14, what fellowship hath light with darkness? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Ephesians 5.11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Ephesians 5.16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. 1 John 2, 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, pulling down imaginations, that's mental images, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. How about Romans 12, 1 and 2? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. How about Psalms 101, verse 1? I walk within my house with a perfect heart. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell in my sight. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. How about Deuteronomy 7? Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, unless thou become an abomination like it. But thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt utterly uh, abhor it. How about Ezekiel 8 here where it says, talks about uh, son of man, see what every man does in the chambers of his imagery. How about Lamentations 3, uh, 51 Mine eye affecteth my heart. How about Proverbs 4 23, keep thine heart with all diligence for out of it are the I issues of life. Now, I know what, you, is that enough Bible? Anybody want no more Bible? Would you like that? Would that be okay? Just 
said, oh, Brother Brown, oh, Brother Brown, I, I know you're right. I know you're right, but I don't know what I'm going to do. I mean, good night, my wife. I, I know it's ruining our home, the filthy Internet. We don't have any firewalls on it, don't have any blocks on it. And I know, and besides that, Brother Brown, the television, I know it's ruining. It's putting an ungodly, worldly atmosphere in our home. But there's nothing I can do. It was nothing you can do unless you just go forward. But you should go forward. You say, you say, preacher, uh, what can I do? She'd throw a fit. No, she wouldn't. No. Your wife's not going to say a word if you'll just go forward. Yeah. If you just go forward. You say, well, what can I do? Well, some night when she's cooking supper and, man, everything's getting grilled in there and your children sitting around here like a bunch of catfish at the end of a drain pipe soaking up all of that filth, you just sneak yonder into the garage and you get you. <laughs> and, uh, and you come back and while your wife's are cooking, you say, children, you may want to move back a little bit. And you take this thing. <laughs> He said, I hate Kevin Scott to say, I hate that thing. I hate, I hate that thing. I hate that thing. Yeah, well, wait a minute. When she comes in, when she comes running in, you be standing there like this going, I hate it. I hate it. She ain't going to say nothing. Some of you men say, hen pet, you have to roost on the bedpost of a night. You ought to get some grit in your crawl. In God's name, why don't you just go forward? Go forward. She won't say a word. Not a word will she say. About six months later, she's normal. She'll come in and catch you in a sweet mood. And she'll say, you know, honey, I was somewhere today and I saw a television and I thought about the, the nights we used to watch that. And you know what you do? You reach and grab the axe and say, <laughs> <laughs> she won't say anything. No, that'll be. No, absolutely. Let me go over here, find the sermon I left behind, and we'll be gone. I mean, it's time to go forward. I mean, I could preach a lot about all kinds of separation. It's time to go forward in everything. Time to go forward in dress standards. I could get on that for a while. Yeah, brother, we need some preaching. Time to go forward. Listen, we don't even preach on beer anymore. I sat over here with C.W. Fist not long ago in a restaurant. And we were fellowshipping, talking about things of the Lord. And there was a fellow sitting to my right, and he kept looking up. And I thought maybe he was under conviction or something, because we were just praising the Lord and talking about the good things of God. And uh, he said, um, he, he, a little bit, I just turned his way. He said, fellas, I want to tell you something. He said, I've been sitting here just enjoying this conversation. I said, wonderful. He said, listen, to find men that, to find men that will take us, that will talk about the Lord, brag on the Lord, people just talk about it right here to, just in front of God and everybody. He said, it's wonderful. I said, good, wonderful. And... Uh, I said, I was about to ask you if you were saved. Oh, yeah, saved. Boy, he was enjoying fellowship while he was drinking his Budweiser, sitting right there on the table just having himself a time. Listen, we've got to go back and preach something. We're not, we're not opening our big mouths. It's not enough just to say, you shouldn't be worldly. We need to give some examples. Listen, this country is going to hell, and our Christian people are going with it as far as our standards are concerned. And we need to get some grit and some guts and some brawn about it and get back to preach. I was looking at a newspaper, wasn't too long ago, in a major newspaper in America, and they were talking about styles coming. Now, in most cases, when they talk about styles coming, they're talking about women's styles. But this was men's style. Give me my picture. Can you get my picture up there? That's what I saw. I didn't get as good a copy as I wanted, but the men did real good. And uh, now those are men's in, men in skirts. That's coming. That's coming. 
It's coming fast. Now, what they did, they put plaid skirts on them, and they put uh, men's uh, uh, shoes, to give it a little masculine look, and put bow tie on one of them just to get things started. You know, they didn't want to come on with the pink, but the pink's coming shortly after that. You're going to see that on the street shortly. According to this uh, major, I think it was USA Today, major American uh, newspaper, you're going to see that coming. It is coming. Now, if they're not queer, they'll do till the queers get here, won't they? And I'm telling you this right now. We need to... Oh, yeah. But, brother, you say, well, what do you see wrong with that? I'll tell you exactly what I see wrong with that. Deuteronomy 22.5 is still in the blessed book. Amen? Still in the blessed book. The Bible is clear when it says, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. Did you hear what I said? Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord. And by the way, this is not, I don't have time to give a Bible discourse, but this is not ceremonial law. This is moral law. I, I'd take 30 minutes, I can prove that to you, but I don't have 30 minutes. But here's what it said. It said, the man shall, uh, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are an abomination to the Lord thy God. Now, mama, I said, mama, I said, mama, your, your, your boy, boy comes in wearing that now, wearing one of those skirts and says, Mama, how do you like it? It's the new style. You know what I want you to do? He's wearing a skirt. If you've been wearing breeches, keep your mouth shut. Keep your mouth shut. It's all in the same verse. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are an abomination unto God. Yeah, you, you ain't got nothing to say about it, Mama. You see, you paved the way. You opened the door. And I'm not surprised you did, because you run around in your shorts anyhow, and your little swim outfit, not enough clothes on to clean out the barrel of a 10-gauge shotgun, your little spaghetti straps, and, and I'm I'm telling you the truth. God have mercy. Deacons' wives. I said deacons' wives in this room and preachers' wives running around with your stretched pants to show your big fat self. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. And those of some of you who have good standards and wear skirts, your skirts are so tight your, the back of your body is shining like a moon. You ought to be ashamed of your face. I mean, God have mercy. Somebody's going to have to spell it out. Somebody's going to have to say it. When God said, let your light shine, that's not what he had in mind. And by the way, some of you preachers, you've got standards. And your wife does dress right. And your girls do dress right. And you do have standards, but you don't say anything about it. I'm going to throw you in shock. Jerry Falwell's in heaven now, but he went way to the left on a lot of things. And Dr. Howe saw, saw him going that way. I remember the days when he preached here. And your pastor, Dr. Howe, preached there. And I remember when I sat under Jerry Falwell in his conferences and all of that. But he went to the left. But I'm going to throw you in the shock. Did you know Jerry Falwell, up to his death, had strong convictions like you do? Jerry Falwell, he had striper and all that so-called Christian rocking. He didn't agree with it. He didn't like it. And said so. He never did agree with a woman wearing breeches. But I want to tell you something. He didn't say anything about it. You better listen to me. He didn't say anything about it. And friend, you're going to have to do more than just have standards and have convictions. You say, well, example. God didn't say by the preaching of example you'll keep things straight. The preaching of the Word. Preach the Bible. It is the Word of God. You've got to get your mouth open and say something. Oh, yeah. I, I, I heard Dr. Howells say on this platform 25 years ago, or that platform over there, he said, here's our problem. He said, here you are, and here's the world. And he said, the world is going to the left, but you're not getting any closer to the world. Here you are, here's the world. The world is moving to the left, but you're not getting any closer to the world. He said, here you are. Here's the world. The world is moving to the left, but you're not getting any closer to the world.
He said, you look at the world, you're as far from the world as you was when you started out. But you're looking at the wrong thing. You're looking at the world instead of how far you've come. You're looking at the world instead of how far you've had. Listen, if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare? Look, you may not have liked everything Tony Hudson said last night. By the way, I did. I liked everything he said. I liked, ev- I liked everything he said. And I liked how he said it, too. I liked that. I, I'm an old southern boy, and he was in my element. I'm going to tell you, I liked it. I, I liked it. I mean, I liked not only what he said, I liked Hey, man, how he said it. I like it. I even like where he got that from. I know where he got it from. Sammy Allen, Resaca, Georgia. That's where he got it from. And I like Sammy. I like what he said, how he said it, and I like where he got it. I, I like it all. like every bit of it. But wait a minute. Whether you did or did not agree with everything that Brother Hudson said last night, I'll promise you this. You didn't go back to your room and sit and try to philosophize about where he was really coming from. I mean, you knew what he meant. You knew what he believed. Brother, one thing you've got to say about he and a lot of godly men that have preached here this week and all weeks, and that's this right here. If the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for the day of battle? It's time that we gave a clear and sound. Listen, we, I like what he said about music too, didn't you? Those tracks. Those tracks. I liked everything he said. I don't even like Russians. I like everything. Preach. I mean, preach. Preach. Standards. Preach. Years ago, in an ancient battle, you, uh, by the way, if it, if it, yeah, here's some water. I'm so dry, I'd have to be primed to spit. Years ago, in an ancient battle, Years ago, in an ancient battle, a, a commander ordered his forces to take a hill. And it was up yonder, and he had a little old standard bearer, a little old flag bearer. And he said, son, he said, rush the standard to the top of that hill, and we'll join you. And a little fellow with fire in his soul rushed to the top of the hill, and he set the standard down. And boy, here came the force to take the hill and take the enemy. But the commanding officer had underestimated the enemy. And the enemy came, and they were pouring over the hill and flooding over the hill. And all of a sudden, there were too many casualties. Too many of his men were falling. All of a sudden, it looked like they would be totally overrun. So he began to scream at his standard bearer, Bring the standard back to the people! Bring the standard back to the people! Bring the standard down here back to the... Quick! That little fellow standing there like he's deaf with his back to him. I mean, it looked like he hadn't heard nothing in his life. Just standing there facing him. Bring the standard back to the people! In a little bit, he turned around and said, No! Bring the people up to the standard! When iniquity shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And I want to tell you, it's high time that we brought the standard back to the people. We need, we, listen, let me tell you something. We need the standard. And brother, by the way, we got the standard right here in this King James Bible. You say, well, oh, no, we got to go back to the originals. No, you don't do that because you don't have the originals. You can't get the originals, and nobody in hundreds of years have, uh, 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 you, you can't find that. But I tell you what you do know, you know in Psalms 12, verse 6 and 7, this right here, you know it says the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation Forever, forever. The word of our Lord endureth forever. Let me tell you something, friend. We have in our hands, this is the word which I have spoken unto you. Paul said, I hold in my hands the very infallible, inerrant, jot and tittle, perfect, preserved, inspired word of God. And I'm glad that I do. Let me tell you something. And you say, well, uh, you know something. God promised that he would never add to or take away from his word. And he pronounced a curse to those that would. He promised he would never add to or take away from his word. But he never promised he wouldn't translate it. And he never promised he wouldn't interpret it. See, the Holy Spirit of God's what interprets it. And he never promised that he would not preserve it. Yeah. 
how's he going to bring it to every generation if you don't translate it? If you don't preserve it? You say, well, God spoke to us in the Hebrew, Aramaic, and the Greek. Uh, he spoke in 14 other languages too in Acts 2. All at one time. You read it there for yourself. Holy men of God from every nation under heaven gathered up there. Uh, I mean, devout men of God. And here were the disciples, ignorant and unlearned men. Suddenly God spoke through them. And every man began to hear the word of God in their own language. How hear we every man the words of God in our own language? And God was speaking through them in 14 languages at one time. What they needed to know. Let me tell you something. God, did you know God knows English? I mean, he, he, he knows English. I mean, he can. And he knows God has brought us the Word of God. And you say, well, if I can't connect all that in history of how we've got the jot and tittle perfect Bible, I, I just, I, you know, I've got a problem with that. But I tell you what, do when you go get that figured out, you go get figured out the blood atonement also. Because, see, see, here's what I'm, I'm going to make a point here. We are people of faith. We know what God said. God said he would preserve his word to every generation. Now, we don't understand all of how he was going to do all he said he was going to do. I mean, he said, uh, call unto me and I'll answer thee. And he said that his blood would forgive everyone if we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, that was blood shed 2,000 years ago. As was said the other night, carried into heaven and sprinkled on the altar of God. It's still there. It will never die. No more than Jesus will die because it's divine blood. It's God's blood. It's still affectious unto everyone as a Christian that asks for cleansing from daily sin. And thank God it's all so effective for that sinner that comes what can wash away my sins nothing but the blood of Jesus but I tell you what you do you explain that you explain that you also explain the deity of God how he can be all God all God not part God all God and all man all at the same time Explain that one. And then while you're at it, explain God's foreknowledge, election, and predestination as in comparison to his free will he in, in, in put in every man to accept or reject that grace. Correlate those two if you can. Get that one all figured out if you can. Now, when you get all of that done, uh, then you can explain to me exactly all the process. I just know that God... See, we're people of faith. We believe the Bible. We believe all that God said. Uh, I came out of a Bible college in the South years ago, and I was a Bible corrector. Now, many scholars don't believe this last half of this particular verse. It was in the, uh, in the original manuscripts or the best manuscripts. And, uh, and, and, uh, but, but, you know, I, I, something got me. Uh, about that first year, and I started preaching. I was 27 years old, and I founded the church there. I'd stand up, and I'd say, This book I hold in my hands is the infallible, inerrant, jot and tittle, perfect Word of God. The Bible is inspired of God. Jot and tittle, perfect. And then it dawned on me one day, Well, what am I correcting it for? What am I, if it's the infallible, inerrant, inspired Word of God, jot and tittle, perfect, verbal, plenary, inspired, what... It, and you know, it dawned on me, either shut up or put up. One or the other. I mean, just say it. If you, if you don't believe it, quit saying it. Don't say it anymore. Don't say the book I hold in my hand is perfect. Where do you think the Word of God is? You say, oh, Brother Brown, the Word of God is winnered in the sum of many translations. Well, go unwinnow it then. Go unwinnow it then. Pull it out. Let's get it out here so we can all look at it. And have it in one volume since the Word of God cannot be broken. Do you see? Here's the thing. There is nobody in the world that's using anything for the English-speaking people than a King James Bible tonight. There's nobody in the world that would even claim they've got a jot and tittle perfect book. Nobody that believes the NIV, ASV, RSV, DDT, MIC, KEY, MOUSE. Nobody... Nobody that has one of those, and even as a scholar, would claim what we are claiming tonight about an infallible book we hold in our hands. 
And I want to tell you something. I had to come to some realization that God had preserved His Word to every generation. Not every generation of scholars, not every generation of Greek scholars and Hebrew scholars, but that God had preserved it. No prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. God has brought His Word to us today. And I had to come to that. And when I came to that, brother, I came to that. I'd never heard of Peter Rutman or D.A. Wade or Gail Rippinger or anybody. I, logic led me to the thing that I've got to know in my heart that I have the jot and tittle. I've got to have it all. For man shall not live by bread alone, but by every, 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 every word uh, that is spoken. We need to go forward. Preach that old King James Bible. We need to go forward in separation. We need to go forward in uh, soul winning. How do you like that one? Uh, do you need to go forward in soul winning? Go ye, go ye, go ye. I send you forth. That's a forward thing. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every somebody. Oh, I can't do that. I, I wouldn't know what to say if I went to the door. You wouldn't? No. No, I, I'm scared to go because I, I wouldn't know what to say if I went up and knocked on the door. Well, I can cure that for you. I can tell you how I can fix that. You go out soul winning and you walk up to a door and knock on the door. Now, you don't know what to say. But a lady comes to the door. She's a rather sophisticated lady. She opens the door. When she opens the door, you, if you don't know what to say, you just look her right in the eye, and here's what you say. And when she, with horror, closes the door, you politely leave the porch and go to the next house, knock on the next door. Now, when that second lady comes to the door, I don't know what you're going to say, but I promise you, you'll think of something better than you said at that first door. <laughs> Amen. You, you'll have something. I, I mean, you'll, you'll make some improvement. The truth of the matter is, if you wanted to... Look, I was at a funeral here just the other day. Uh, a lady died. She'd come... A, a couple of times with her twin sister to my church years ago, 20, 28 years ago. And uh, they moved, and, and uh, they were two girls, rather rough girls, and, and they didn't stay long, and they went to Missouri uh, with their family. And I got a call, and I, I remembered the name because it was Nancy and Pansy Darling. That was the names. So the last names were Darling. Nancy and Pansy. And uh, the, the hospice called and said, Nancy is dying. But she said that she had attended your church a couple of times years ago, and she said that she would like for you to do the funeral, Pastor Brown, and she was wondering if you could uh, if do it. I said, yes, ma'am, I'll be glad to. I, I enjoy helping people at, in times of grief. And I said, I'll do you better than that. I said, I'll go to see her. I'll see her this week, uh, 42 miles away. Uh, everybody, everybody goes to my church a long ways away. And, uh, and, and I drove up there and went in there one night and walked in, and the whole room was full of people. They heard I was coming. Pastor was coming. And the whole room, I don't know how many was in it, eight or ten. And, uh, and, and I sat down, and I had a few kind words, and I said, Nancy, 14 months ago, I buried my wife with brain cancer. Actually started out breast cancer, and then it went to her brain, got her. I said, I've been through what you're going through right now with my wife. And I said, I watched day by day. What you, she, was on, she was down to the last. I had her funeral last Saturday. She was down to the last, just a few days ago. But her mind was clear. She was still setting up. And I said, now I want you to look in my eyes. Don't ever give up hope. God can still heal. And God can still work miracles. But in most of the cases, when you have cancer like you've got, and at the stage you've got, it is God's indication that you're going to leave this world. It is God's indication it's your time to go. Now, Nancy, I'm not pulling any, any, any strings now. I'm not... I'm not, I'm not messing with you. I'm telling you something. You're in trouble, but I can help you get out of trouble. You're going to die. I can't heal you. I, I, can't, I can pray for you, and I will pray for you. I can't heal you, Nancy. But I want to tell you something. It appears you know, and I know it appears you're going to leave this world. She said, I know. I don't have long. I know I'm going to die. And uh, she was uh, very weak, but very rational. And I said, Nancy, I said, tell you what. I said, I want to, uh, I, I want to tell you something, and I want the rest of y'all to listen to it. I said, Nancy, look, you're going to leave this world, but you can go to a better world. 
and, and you can be forgiven and you can have eternal life and you can get out of this life and you can get out of cancer and you can get out of sickness and you can get out of weakness and you're going to, if you listen to what I say, I can tell you who can give you eternal life so that you never die. And I just broke out into a preaching mode and I just uh, stepped right there and I just told the gospel story of the cross and Jesus and his love, his wonderful love. And I saw that lady bow her head and get born again. And I saw her sister get born again. And I saw her sister's husband get born again. And I saw their son get born again. And I saw their grandson get born again. And I saw a friend that was there get born again. By the grace of God, look, we keep our mouth shut too much. We just get our mouth. I had the funeral this past Saturday and stood there at the grave. Five other people showed up. Nobody showed up but family, but there was a big family tree. He kept coming. Five other people showed up that got saved under the tent. Down, Joseph, who sang over here a while ago, sang under the tent. I played the guitar while he sang, and, uh, and, and he sang Amazing Grace. We gave an invitation, and five more got born again. Oh, in God's name, if only we'd go far. Forward. If only we'd go forward. Amen and amen. I was over here at O'Hara Field uh, a week and a half ago. I was coming back from somewhere and uh, I was flying through O'Hara Field. And uh, I, I, I checked the gate. I said, ma'am, uh, the plane's here. She said, the plane's here. We got about a 20-minute turnaround. She said, I said, how long for board? She said, we'll board in 10 minutes or thereabout. I said, okay. I looked across the hall and there's some of that little naked juice over there. That's good juice. And I, and I said, I'm going to get me one of them. And I just got time to take that and drink it before I get on the plane. And I walked over. It was just, it wasn't a store. It was just a little stand. And place wasn't much wider than this right here, just a, a little cooler there, and it had the, the, the juice in it. And a lady standing there, a little place about this side, uh, big for a cash register. And uh, she was a oh, a 50 ish lady, uh, I think a little Hispanic. And she, uh, she was, uh, and I, I got the juice and paid for it. And um, I said, Ma'am, let me give you something to read. I was in a hurry, you know. I said, Let me give you something to read. Here's a little gospel track. She said, Thank you, sir. She said, Are you observing Ash Wednesday? And she had the ashes here on her head. I said, uh, No, ma'am. She said, You're a preacher and you don't observe Ash Wednesday? I said, No, ma'am. She said, Why don't you? I said, Well, I don't because I never found it in the Bible. I just, just never found it. I never, never was commanded of the Lord to do that. If it had been in there and God told me to, I'd have done it. I said, we do baptize and we take communion, but we don't, we don't observe Ash Wednesday. She said, oh, she looked so puzzled. And she said, can I ask you a question? She said, I had a son that died, and, and all of a sudden she was just overtaken with grief, though he had been dead several years. She said, I had a son that died, and somebody said sometimes their angels would come back and visit us. Do you think I would ever see him? Do you think there's any way that I could see him? And I thought, well, her son is probably lost. Now what do I say? Yeah, you'll see him in hell. You know, I didn't want to say that. And I, I thought, well, um, I said, well, I said, I don't know about that. She said, you know, we did one time. Uh, she said, we did or he did. I can't remember which she said. Uh, boy, I wish I could play that back. But she, uh, 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 he did for sure. I take that back. He did, and maybe she did too. It was either him or him and her. But he had been, uh, she said, we did go to a Baptist church a little bit uh, when he was a little younger. And I said, really? Uh, I said, by the way, what church was it? She said, First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana. And... Um, I said, yeah, I know that church. I'm very familiar with that church. I said, you know something? I know that church tells people how to be saved. I know they tell people how to go to heaven. I said, I can't tell you your son trusted Christ as his Savior at that church, but I can tell you this. It would have been highly unlikely if he got in there and got out without somebody telling him how to be saved. I said, that would have been high. If he went to Sunday school and then children's church, I said, it would have been highly unlikely if he got in there and got out without somebody telling him how to be saved. And I said, let me tell you something. I said, you're observing Ash Wednesday and you're a Catholic and I'm Baptist, but did you know all the Baptist churches and all the Catholic churches in the world won't get you to heaven? Oh, really? I said, yes, ma'am, that's right. And it's a pitiful. She is a sweet lady, a little plain, and her teeth kind of stuck out right here and when she'd talk her lip and catch, and I had compassion on her. My heart went out to her. And all of a sudden, and I knew I was about to be late for the flight, but I thought, good grief. I mean, let the plane fly. Here's somebody that needs to go to heaven. And I just said, I, I, I just opened the track. I wrote a good track here, King James versions in, uh, verses in it. And I just showed her right here from the 
Bible, how to be saved. And I said, uh, tell me something. I said, I, if I had a little more time, she said, hey, I, the business is slow right now. Enough, I look, nobody behind me. She said, uh, uh, to talk to me. She didn't say, don't leave me, but in essence, that's what I could feel. Don't leave me now. Don't leave me now. And I, I, I said, wouldn't you like to be? I would. I would. And I saw that dear lady under severe conviction uh, about her head and pray, oh, Jesus, come into my heart and save me by the grace of God. We need to go forward, go forward, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We need to go forward in separation. We need to go forward in preaching. We need to go forward with that King James Bible. We need to go forward in soul winning, and we just need to go forward. You know, in the book of Exodus, we find that they came to Kadesh Barnea. And when they came to Kadesh Barnea, they had it made in the shade with lemonade. Except for one thing. They appointed a committee. That was the end of it. I mean, God had instructed, go into the land. But they appointed a committee. And the committee came back and said, we can't do it. And for 40 years, they wandered around in the wilderness. For 40 years, they wandered around in the wilderness. Now, 40 years later, they came back. Two spies went in, and they found an unusual thing. They found there was Rahab the harlot, who was living on the wall. And Rahab said something that blew the doors off of my soul. Here's what she said. She said this in Joshua chapter 2, and I want to read it to you. Jot the reference down if you like. You'll like this. Joshua 2, 10 and 11. Here's what she said. I can find it. Here it is. Joshua 2, 10. It says, For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when ye came out of Egypt. Now that was 40 years earlier. That's what they had heard. And said, uh, And what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more carriage in any man because of you. Now, wait a minute. Something hit me had never hit me before. Forty years earlier, when they were looking at high walls and saw themselves as grasshoppers in the sight of giants, forty years later, when they were saying, we can't do it, the giants are too big, the wall's too high, the obstacles are too great, We'll turn back, tempt God, and limit the Holy One of Israel. Forty years later, when they were saying it's too much, we can't do it, they didn't know, but inside of those walls were people trembling. Inside of those walls were people scared to death. Forty years later, God had already prepared the way, but they couldn't see it. You see, we're people of faith. And I'm speaking to people tonight. Some of you preachers, you need to go forward in preaching. Some of you Christians, you need to go forward in living it. And we need to go forward in our separation, in our standards, in our uh, uh, soul winning. Uh, but what we can't see is God has opened marvelous doors for us, but he won't show it to us until we go forward. Now, all over America, I preach this sermon, and when I come to this point, I say this. If you see a point back yonder, you see a point back yonder, and you say, that's it, but there's too many obstacles in the way. Then, here's what happens. At that point, I say, you just go forward. And I get up on the back of the pews and walk all the way to the back. I've done that all over America. Did that in the National Sword Conference. Did it in Dr. Trevor's church and a bunch of other churches. But Dr. Scott already has too much liability on him right here. And besides that, I didn't, get, I didn't tell him about doing that. So I'm not going to do that, but I'll tell you this right now. You just go forward. 
You go home and you go forward. You go forward tomorrow when you see somebody that you, that you could give a track to. You just take a step and go forward. Go forward. Go forward. Go forward. And God will go with you. He'll go with you. I'm pressing on my upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Just go forward. Let me say this. I liked everything he said, how he said it, and that amen, amen, everything. You know, too many of you have gotten too slick in your Christianity. Let's just be honest. You know, you really think there's anybody in this room that's really too clean, too pure, too holy? You sit there in your self-righteousness, and I'm not to point my finger at anybody except myself, but you know, you work so hard to kind of do things just right and not ruffle the feathers and try to make sure you're not uh, ruffling the waves, you know, and ma making a mess. You, you need somebody like this all the time to come in and just upset the apple cart and say, hey, let's get down to brass tacks. Let's get, let's get to driving some real nails in it. You know, that, that, that cross kind of living kind of separates the men from the boys. And... Uh, you know, th this isn't a college kid preaching here. This is a man in his mid-60s who's gone through the loss of his wife, built a church 38-plus years at one place, building a church. Many of us have been to that church. That's a rock-solid group of believers that anybody, any pastor would covet to have for a congregation. And, uh, and, and, and beyond, besides that, this is a man that lives what he preaches. That wasn't, that wasn't a sermon. That was a message from a life lived holy before God for these years. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Brown. I like that.